Friday on the 100 inch? Uh, well, for this second first light, it was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Really much better. Yeah. And uh, so I think we really did a nice job on that. After you, John. Okay. So one of these rooms is where Dad stayed. Yep. I think it was here. I think it was five. Uh -huh. Quite interesting. Uh, a history of Egypt by Hale's friend uh, James Henry Breasted. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Well, Hale was very much interested in uh, Egyptian uh, Middle Eastern uh, uh, culture. And he made a, a number of trips there, of course, uh, during his lifetime. And he was a very good friend of Breasted uh, and visited the uh, antiquities, at, particularly at Alexandria and, uh, and Cairo. Mm -hmm. So this, this, I'm sure, was many times uh, read by and handled by Hale. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there are even... There are even some of his his writing here, George Ellery Hale. Uh, so it appears, Don, that uh, Hale might have had this book with him on his first trip very, to Egypt. Very likely. I think there's not much question about that. Uh, maybe he was even boning up a little bit before he got there mm -hmm. so that he could uh, have a more intelligent conversation with Breasted himself. Sure. This row of books is the... Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, and it was used, as you can see, profusely by, by Hubble uh, when he was trying to come up with a good subject for dinner conversation. Hmm. Uh, he would uh, uh, pull, out, pull out a volume and find an obscure topic and use that as the subject of, uh, of dinner conversation, which, of course, he could then dominate. This was a very popular room, particularly on a cold uh, winter night uh, with a roaring fire in the fireplace. And uh, on a cloudy night, it was pretty busy, usually a bridge game or two going on in the, in the, in the place. Uh, these chairs are interesting. Uh, Einstein uh, seated there uh, when he had his picture taken here in 1931. And we actually have a photograph of Einstein yeah, actually, in this room. In this room and sitting in that chair. Sitting in that very chair there with Edwin Hubble standing behind him in the doorway. Hubble was not averse to standing close to uh, famous people if, if he could. Hmm. Uh, he's often seen when a time that... Uh, Einstein was here in 1931. Uh, Hubble uh, made sure that he was usually fairly close to Einstein when the picture was taken. There are many fascinating books in this library, but one in particular that's always intrigued me is this book of poetry, Paolo and Francesca, that was Hale's copy. Uh, this book of Hale's, of course, is inscribed by him uh, September uh, 3rd, 1901. So it would have been a book which he had uh, or obtained when he was in Chicago living there. Brought to uh, Mount Wilson when he came here first in 1903. It's a play, a tragedy in four acts. Here's another fascinating book in this library. It's a book that belonged to Harlow Shapley and it's on the botany of the Angeles National Forest, these local mountains here. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Well, Shapley, of course, was, he left Mount Wilson in uh, about 1920, along there to be, take the uh, position as director of the Harvard College Observatory. But he was very much interested in the environment here in the, mount, in, in the Angeles National Forest. Uh, he, uh, botany, and also he specialized a great deal in the study of ants. And by ants, I don't mean his parents' uh, sisters, uh, but the A-N-T-S, ants. 
But this is a fascinating book in that it, in several places it has pressings of uh, some of the plants that uh, grew here. Here, for example, is a plant, a pressing of a wildflower, uh, and that particular um, pressing would have been made not quite, but close to a hundred years ago. All right, well, this is the dining room where the staff uh, had their meals. There was a uh, protocol. Uh, the observer on the 100 inch always sat at the head of the table. Uh, to his right, the observer on the 60 inch telescope. And uh, to his uh, left, the chief solar observer. And then the peons uh, on down the line. It was the duty of the person at the head of the table to summon the uh, custodian of the meal, and he did so by ringing the bell. Don, your dad spent a lot of time observing with this telescope, didn't he? He did, yes. One of the things, of course, that the observer had to do first thing in the morning was to make a drawing of the sun, and he would do that by projecting the solar image onto a proper sheet of paper and then sketching in the individual spots and other objects that might, you know, an occasional airplane flying by, but uh, those are hard to catch. and difficult to sketch as they go by. What do all these numbers mean here on this sunspot drawing? Well, they indicate various things, primarily location of the spot, uh, latitude and longitude on the uh, solar surface, and then uh, sometimes uh, information about the magnetic field around the sun. Mm. Okay. Uh, now this is a drawing that was done by my father back in 1938. May 21st, 1938. Uh, in the uh, 30s, your dad discovered the uh, ninth moon of Jupiter? Uh, the, ninth, the ninth was actually... On October 5th, 1923, Edwin Hubble took the great M31 plate here in the 100-inch dome of the Andromeda galaxy showing that Cepheid variable. That was the day that the universe expanded in volume greatly. But really, how long did it take Hubble to reduce all that data, and when was that final, finally well, there, publicized? There are several questions about that. First place, did Hubble take the plate, or mm -hmm. did Hummison? Ah, okay. Sure. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it would have been processed, of course, that that morning, or uh -huh. the next morning, That's I'm it. sure would have, and probably Hummison did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how many days after that did they get down to the uh, Santa Barbara Street and we'll mm -hmm. really take a look and get the information? Mm -hmm. And then, and you, as you well know, uh, you've got to take several pictures of a Cepheid variable in sure. order to know what the period is. Sure. You can't get that with one shot. Sure. So um, when they finally realized what they had and could reduce the data and get an idea of the absolute magnitude uh, and therefore how far away it is, um, that's got to be months. Sure. So I don't know. Yes. And as I say, I'm not even sure whether it was Hubble himself 
that took the plate. Sure, that's right. So how did this panel actually work to control the telescope? Well, the telescope, of course, was moved, driven by motors of one sort or another, but the, to know where it was pointed, actually, uh, about each axis was a device called a setting circle, a uh, big circular thing with uh, degrees uh, marked on it and with an index mark uh, and calibrated in such a fashion that uh, operator by looking into uh, one or the other of these two eyepieces into this one he could look and see where the telescope was set in terms of rotation this way and through here well it was set for rotation uh, north and south um, and that was while he was looking he'd be pressing the appropriate button to move the telescope to the point where he wanted it finally uh, uh, set up. It, it seems like the attention to detail in the design and construction of this telescope was incredible. They thought of every last thing when they built this telescope in this dome. They were building actually with a technology which uh, at the time was the state of the art. Uh, that's um, the way it was done. We're going to use the latest technology, the latest techniques possible, and that, of course, is represented by these things now. I might say that uh, that, of course, was uh, in the years B.C., before computers, mm -hmm. so uh, the telescope still moves in the same way that it did before, but under a different, under computer control, uh, things of that sort. I understand that in the 1930s, you actually used this telescope to do some research for your father. Well, that's uh, quite correct. Uh, Dad had some time reserved on the telescope uh, to follow, keep up to date, keep track of the ninth satellite of Jupiter, which he had discovered when he was a student at uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, when I heard that that was what he wanted to do, uh, I told him, I said, Dad, I think I can make that observation. His response, of course, was, no way. Uh, you're too young, not a chance that you could do it. So obviously, uh, with that kind of a response, I kept after him. If he'd said, yes, you can, why, well, I'd have forgotten all about it, and uh, that would have been the last of it. But when he said no, why, well, I had to keep after him. And finally, a few days before the actual date, he finally said, well, maybe you can. Mm -hmm. So we came up here in the afternoon of the date and ran through the uh, requirements, what I had to do. It was on a February night uh, and at the Newtonian uh, focus of the telescope. So the observations were made on this platform here. Um, so the night fell, started in, of course, the dome shutter was open. It was a February night, and the wind was blowing right in on my back while I was sitting in a chair up there on the platform. Mm. And um, when I looked up, Dad was gone. So about 15 minutes later, it hit me. He knew right off the bat that when I first mentioned it, that it was going to be cold that night. <laughs> He'd been down in the galley, of course, probably uh, nice and warm and talking with some of his buddies. I sat there for three hours in the cold, guiding the telescope, taking the observation. The end of three hours, 
There was Dad, warm, toasty. Uh, it was that night that uh, I convinced myself that astronomy was not for me as a profession. Now, well, this is the plate, a plate holder. It could go either the Cassegrain or the Newtonian. And then to start the exposure, uh, you would pull this dark slide out, start the exposure. Um, then guide, you'd have an eyepiece that was usually mounted some convenient spot. This is one, otherwise you might have it mounted so that you could set it up to find a, a, a bright star. You didn't guide on the actual object that you were photographing, but on a nearby object. So you're saying this is a guiding eyepiece. Did you have to have your eye glued to that all night long while you were taking an exposure? Well, uh, normally, yes. You, would, you, you wouldn't be necessarily up against it continuously, but you, you couldn't look away. Uh, in the early days, the photographic emulsions were not as fast, mm -hmm. were not as sensitive as they later became. Mm -hmm. uh, they would actually maybe have exposure over several nights. What do we have here, Don? Well, this is a reproduction. Uh, it's a list of the names of all of the people present on the night that the telescope was turned for the first time uh, to an object to observe and determine something about the quality of, of the imagery. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the names here are names of workmen, people who were working on the telescope um, during the day, during the weeks previously, and uh, Hale invited them, stick around, this is going to be a historic uh, occasion. Mm -hmm. Adams, of course, the assistant director, mm -hmm. Hale himself even, was here. Sure. these beautiful blueprints, Don. Well, they're all here. We could rebuild the telescope if we had to from the blueprints that are available. And they're dated, wow, 1916. These are old drawings. Oh, yes. The artwork in this mechanical drawing is, is really impressive. This is truly a piece of art. It is. Well, the draftsmen in those days, of course, now it's all done by computers, uh, but uh, they did it on a drafting table with um, pencil, a very sharp pencil, and drafting instruments. They were truly amazing men back then. Yep. <laughs>